The House of Representatives is hinting at potential legal action against ex-Twitter and FBI lawyer James Baker, who is involved in suppressing the 2020 media reports related to the Hunter Biden laptop story. According to Fox News, Republican leaders suggested that all options are on the table when asked whether they would pursue legal action or issue subpoenas related to Baker. A House Judiciary spokesperson told the outlet in an email to, quote, stay tuned. Twitter CEO Elon Musk announced Tuesday that he had fired Baker for his possible role in suppression of important information, uh, of information rather important to public dialogue. Congress is already uh, Congress is already weighing in on the matter. Tuesday, Congressman James Comer, who is set to be the next chairman of the House Oversight Committee, sent a letter to Baker asking him to appear before the committee to assess, quote, big text control of free discourse and information. And Georgia Congressman Andrew Clyde introduced the Free Speech Defense Act, which he says will end government by proxy censorship. Hmm. So a lot happening here. Robbie, am I, am I wrong to think that this, um, the kind of threat of legal action is a, is a little bit vague? I mean, what did they... What do they what do they hope to pin James Baker with other than kind of having an ideological conflict of interest over right. the Hunter Biden story? Which yeah, I, I like don't known... uh, unless there's he violated some kind of disclosure rule uh, as a post federal employee, some kind of thing there. I, I don't see what you would get him because he, he did what we're upset that he did. He did in his capacity as a private citizen, as an employee of Twitter. And, and that can be bad and wrong. It's not a violation of law. They can subpoena him. They can have. They can bring him before Congress, like they've brought before Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pichai and all the tech people to ask questions, and that might be productive. Although I tend to think those hearings end up being a little show trialy, and mm -hmm. it, it often turns out that the members of Congress have no idea what they're talking about on tech-related issues and are asking them, and then end up asking them paradoxical things or co contradictory things where mm -hmm. they'll say, how, how dare you, Republicans saying, how dare you censor and silence us, and Democrats saying, how dare you allow misinformation on the platform, and the tech people are like, okay, what do you want us to do then? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't have a lot of faith in, in, that, uh, in that sort of approach, although I am certainly curious what this guy, you know, how his, his FBI connections, how his law enforcement background made him um, uh, 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 amenable to the narrative that this was going to be a fake Russian camp, uh, plot to undermine elections and that the hacked material justification was good, which he did. We didn't have an email from him saying exactly that. Uh, but in general, the right approach is, and I just looked at this bill that, uh, that the Georgia Congressman Andrew Clyde introduced, the Free Speech Defense Act. And this is the approach. If you're mad about censorship on social media, this is the approach that needs to be taken because there's nothing you can, there's very little you can do actually to the companies themselves because they are private companies. You could change reg various regulations. You could break them up. You could do all these things. It's not going to solve the underlying problems of censorship. It's going to change how these companies work. But this bill, which this is the approach we have to take, prohibit, it, it looks at the federal aid entities, the people who do currently work for the government and would say that they cannot have communications with social media companies encouraging them to take down content or stuff like that. That you could mm -hmm. do. You could, you could forbid government employees from doing these things. You can't, provi you can't prohibit Twitter moderators from doing these things. Yeah, it's interesting. I right. mean, my, my interest would be in a certain level of transparency. You know, I can see a world where it's perfectly reasonable for a more informed party, not saying that the government is necessarily the more informed party, but could be potentially in a national security moment or something be able to advise. I don't know about a prohibition against it. I think part of the issue here is that it was all undercover. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't clear who was and doing they, the advice. Political. And the advice itself was political and, and, wrong, and wrong and in a way that couldn't really be scrutinized because it was so private. Um, and I am also, as I talked about in a recent radar this week, concerned about who else is going to be comprising the internal panels that are making these kinds of decisions. Because as we've seen, you know, Baker worked for Twitter. Th this, this wasn't a situation where an outsider was making these decisions. How, for better or worse, whatever his influences were from having worked at the FBI, whatever his connections were, this was a Twitter employee ultimately who, make, who was making these decisions who persisted in being a Twitter employee right up until a second ago when he finally got fired by Elon Musk. So, you know, 
the problem is that we live in a society where there's a lot of elite capture because that's who works at these kind of institutions. Dr. Fauci's daughter works at these institutions. Everybody wants to work at Twitter and Facebook, especially as, as young, mm -hmm. like Gen Z millennial types coming up. And you're going to persist in having this problem even if you don't have kind of official lobbying from the state going on. So I'm very, very interested to see who gets put on these kind of boards that Musk has said he is going to establish to try to, try to adjudicate. But isn't it interesting that liberal progressive people, Democrats or democratically inclined people, not literal democratic politicians, but people of that persuasion, the, the sort of people who staff these companies used to have, or at least in the Bush years, had this kind of reflexive distrust of law enforcement and national intelligence, et cetera, that seems to have fallen by the, way, the wayside a little bit, where now you know, if, if you have a if you have an FBI person telling telling you or telling your 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 woke company your, that that oh this is here's some intelligence we have be on the lookout for this like oh yeah okay that makes sense but they used to say but maybe you're lying or wrong or nakedly well, political I, or just bad at your jobs I well I think that first of all the state the 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 deep state the State Department the, the FBI CIA the, like the that kind of apparatus has always been less partisan and that it has been establishment protecting. Oh, certainly. And when your when your party is in power, you like yeah. the FBI. When your party is not in power, you don't like the FBI. At least that's the kind of um, really reductive perspective that mainstream establishment politicos have always had. The left has had its critique of the FBI and the CIA forever. Um, and I understand that there's some parts of the right have as well. But I, I don't, I, I mean, I know I'm not trying to split yeah. hairs here. I do think it's meaningful. Like, you can sit here and say this is partisan, 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 and these are libs trying to take over, and libs did this, and libs suppressed Hunter Biden. But you're going to wake up one day to a sore, like a sorry reality when Republicans are doing the exact same nonsense. And so I think you should nip it in the bud and really try to put some policies in place that are going to be neutral and stop trying to see this, stop trying to look at this through an ideological lens. I have no interest in defending liberals by saying this isn't really about liberals. Liberals, I got to say, for the millionth time, make my life more hell every single day than, than conservatives ever could dream of doing. I have no, there's no love lost between me and liberals, but I'm looking at this and I'm looking to, at a system that is easily manipulated by any number of people. Mm -hmm. The fact that, the, you know, so how many times do we have to see a, a, um, a, 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 a politico who has been in office through like four different presidents, who has been there through four different administrations, Fauci. over and over and over yeah. again. And so now, you know, he and Trump fell out, so he's a liberal guy, and everybody hates. You know, if, if remember yeah. earlier in the in the thing in, in the pandemic, Trump was very pro Fauci. Fauci was my guy. I'm taking credit. It none of it means anything. At the end of the day, do we like what happened? Do we think decisions were made in an ethical way, in a transparent way, based on real information? Like, that's the only question, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And the fact that I think Elon Musk also has to take some accountability for if Baker is such a terrible person, keeping him on his staff. He buys Twitter ostensibly. His stated purpose is to correct exactly these kinds of issues. And it took this happening you know what? A month into his ownership of Twitter, we just we just he disagree on this one. Before he realizes I that this guy don't is even think there. that's a crazy amount of time to have. If if I were, print if I were spending forty four billion dollars ostensibly because I believe so strongly in free speech, and the Hunter Biden laptop story suppression was the primary motivator for me making this forty four billion dollar investment then I feel like it would be a pretty high priority immediately to start to investigate who it was that was making those kinds of decisions. If that was an oversight, then I think that it's completely fair, but you cannot try to say, oh, I was hood a banker, banker, I can't believe this happened. This is a disaster. Like you have to ha take some accountability and some, you know, have some introspection. This there. actually goes to a point that is, I think is worth making, which is that conservative media for all its contrarian nature does not there, and there are obviously exceptions, but does not have the reporting capabilities that mainstream and progressive media do. Um, I, I'm criticizing them. They don't have enough people doing an effective job. Whereas this, the fact that, so this person, Jim Baker, former FBI employee, I mean, this is something we're kind of like finding out in real time that Elon found out in real time. If it was the other way around, you could have had uh, a, a, a mainstream organization could have, you know, written about the secret conservative working inside Twitter at the highest level. Like that kind of reporting, that those kinds of exposés, don't happen at the same level on the right because conservative media is often, I'm afraid to say, sorry to say, not afraid to say, sorry to say, asleep at the wheel when it comes to big stories like this. Like they have to drop into their laps. 
Well, look, there are conservative reporters at all of these major papers, much to the chagrin, frankly, of many of the liberal reporters at all of these major papers. What do you mean? The Washington Post, New York Times, they have any number of conservative reporters at these papers as well. You can do Not these kind really. of deep dives. They have very few. Even the very Intercept. Few. I mean, there's people at the Intercept who aren't wild about the fact that, like, Jim Risen is a, is a, on a staff reporter there. You know, like, they're... They, they exist, whether or not they choose to spend their time doing this there's kind There's like of a Republican faculty member. Yes, there are some. It's very, very few. Well, I, I can't. I think the real issue is that the, what they're prioritizing. And if they want to keep doing deep dives into, you know, whether there's a drag show somewhere that they didn't like, yeah. then that's, that's a reporting choice. There's no, no like, I agree with you. There's, I, there's, I, there's, there's no, like, you. magic wand that says you work at the New York Times now. You have uh, access to do deep reporting on stories. These are choices that these very well-funded, I might add. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with right, you. Conservative. I, I, I agree with you. They're not, they're, their choices are not always good. And, yes, they're, they get obsessed with things that are a little trivial, and, they're, and they, they don't get the job done. I, I agree with you. That's All the right. criticism I'm making. Okay. It needs to be, it needs to be more focused. And it's, you can criticize the New York Times for its slant or its ideology, whatever you, but they are doing work that uh, a lot of people in right-wing media could, could learn from the mm. craft. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. I would love to see more deeply researched um, reporting because Tucker democracy Carlson said dies that. in darkness. Tucker Carlson said that <laughs> years and years and years and years ago. He gave a speech at CPAC mm. where he said, we should be trying to emulate the New York Times because mm. they do great reporting. Mm. And uh, at the time he got booed, but he was totally right. Mm. Well, now's your chance. Uh, there's, a, there's a hole in the New York Times market right now with this ongoing strike, so we'll see if conservatives can uh, fill the void. More rising after this.